business. So, like, I ain't even care. I was just like, man, I was just a fan. Oh, wow. Hey, y'all. We live. Welcome to the first edition of The Stroll Show with Shady Will and the man of the hour, Mr. Stroll Miles, who is better known as Stroll Show. And I'm going to throw up the... Okay, I'm throwing... Yeah, that's right. Okay. Stroll Show. <laughs> All right. So... It, it, it means something else to people I went to high school with, but you know, I just took it and... Ran with it? Yeah. Um, you trademarked it. Well, I didn't trademark it, but so to speak. Well, you seen what um, Tom Brady told Drew Brees, like Drew Orleans and all that oh, stuff. Oh yeah, that's so some, you yeah, something like that. So you want um, consider doing it now? No. <laughs> <laughs> okay, y'all. As you know, like I said, this is the Stroll Show. If you watched um, Stroll when he came on an interview with the Social Goals back then, you know he had some unique stories to go along with his experience being in the NBA. So with his show that you're gonna see, hopefully weekly, depending on his schedule. Um, we're going to talk about different experiences in life. So, like I said, we're going to get into it. And like I said, this is former NBA player, LSU Tiger alumni, Fair Park High School alumni. Uh, and everything else you want to add on to it. But like I said, we're about to go ahead and get into this. And we're going to, you know, we hope we like, we hope you, we hope y'all like what y'all see right now. Don't judge me on the sound bites. It's the first one. So you already know what happens when you're doing stuff for the first time. Okay, so Stroke, we're going to go ahead and um, solo this out. The first question that we want to hop into today, and we want to talk about the experience. You know, last week, the last dance, and we're going to bring this up for our Social Ghost Live audience, Facebook Live audience. And you posted a picture, which we're going to um, let everyone see. Yourself getting ready. To you know, you regard the greatest of all times when he's playing for the Washington Wizards. So we know that you actually posted online and kind of talked a little bit about that experience. So the last day, you asked some questions. I mean, kind of talk about that experience, man. As far as first, maybe talking about MJ, man. Like, what was that experience like? Well, the first time I actually got to meet MJ, I was a senior in high school. I went to this this camp in North Carolina, and I was able to get an autograph uh, hat. I might post that one next week. Probably next Sunday. Um, but he autographed a hat for me from this flight school camp. And I thought that was pretty cool. Like, that was like the first time that I had ever been starstruck. Okay. <laughs> Getting a chance to meet him there. But uh, actually, my first my first year, I didn't get a chance to, to play against him. I was hurt. The first time we played him, I was hurt. So I didn't get the opportunity to play against him. I was kind of upset about that because like, that was one of my dreams and one of my goals to just, just get out there and just be on the same court with, with Mike. Okay. Um, I think it was 2002, we finally got a chance to play against Mike. He was with the Washington Wizards. Um, and we were like 0-12. And, 12, and I, I just remember like waking up that morning going to the pregame. Uh, man, just... It's about to be crazy. Like I'm getting ready to be on the floor with, with Mike, and I couldn't. Normally, I go home and eat lunch, and I take a nap before the game. But I couldn't even sleep. Like I was, I was so so hyped up about playing against Mike. Okay. So uh, before the game, I went over to the to the photographers. And I was like, look, um, I stand next to Mike. Make sure y'all take this picture. So the picture that you, that you posted, <laughs> like he, I don't think he was ready. His eyes were closed. Um, but that was that was one of my favorite pictures. So I, I made no to take the picture. But uh, man, it was I was nervous because I the MJ that I remember was his him dunking on seven footers. So I was trying my best not to let that happen. So when he drove to the to the rim, I was either gonna foul, I was gonna block his shot, I was gonna foul it before he tried to dunk on me. But back then, you know, he was forty years old at that time. Okay. Like still, at that time, he still was one of the like the greatest players in the game at that time because he he averaged about twenty points. I think he had twenty points that game against us. But you know, he's 40, 40 years old and he's still able to go out there and and get 30, 40 points in a game. I was like, man, when I turned 40, I felt like I couldn't even jump. <laughs> but, man, it was, it was just an honor and just a, like a humbling and great experience just to be able to share the court with MJ. 
Okay. So, all right, the last dance. You know, uh, ESPN came out with the documentary about, you know, about the last dance. So, you know, like I said, people ask you questions, and we kind of talk about, you know, the Chicago Bulls. Right. Now, with you being in the league at that time, were you a fan of the Chicago Bulls as well, with playing against? Well, at that time, I was still in high school, but I was, I was a big fan. So, they broke the Bulls up after that 98 season. Okay. So... Like once I got in the league, I got in the league in 2000. But the stories you still would hear the stories from the players, the veterans that played in that in that era during that time. So you would hear the stories about all the stuff that Scotty and Jordan went through. Stories why they didn't continue that run that they were on. Cause that, that was a special team that they had. They should have probably won at least two or three more championships. Right. With that team, but um, you know you hear the. The good stories, the bad stories. It was, it was a lot going on at that time. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So within the the confines of the game, I guess more of the behind the scenes, you know, things that happen in the NBA. And I know you say you can kind of relate without, you know, without giving information. Like as far as the business of, you know, this is your, you know, this is how you live, you know. Yeah, without, so, without throwing people under the bus. Mm -hmm. Like the league can be can be dirty sometimes. Like it's it's cutthroat, and it's man, you you, you learn at an early age that is that it is a business. Like you grow up as a kid, like just loving the game. Right. But some people don't understand once you get there. Like you still have to have that love for the game, but you you have to develop that business mindset as well when you when you're dealing with like management because like a lot of people get mad. A lot of people are mad at LeBron for leaving Cleveland and going the to first time. Yeah, the first time. When okay. He went to Miami, but for me, being around and seeing situations of how how tough the business can be. Right. Like I, I've been in the locker room with guys, and I've seen them come to practice, practice practice gear on, ready to go, and you get out on the court. They tell you to go back because you've been traded. Or you could be sitting in the locker room just watching on the ESPN on the ticker and you see your name go across, you've been traded to whatever team. So I always felt like you have to do what's best for you and your family because the same way LeBron, when he went to to Miami, if Cleveland could have got a better deal, somebody that was better than LeBron, anything to to help them win a championship or, or, or get to their goal that they're trying to do, they would have got rid of him in a heartbeat. So for him to control the narrative and, and go out and on his own journey to do what, what he wanted to do, go somewhere where, where he was happy, and then he was able to go there and win, like I was all for it, like I was happy. Right. Like, like back, back then, when Mike Nell was playing, they couldn't control the narrative like that, like they couldn't control where they wanted to go play or play with who they wanted to play with. So I think that's an improvement from, and you can see the growth of the game from, from the 90s until, until now. So. Okay. So we're going to um, move on for this subject, but I mean, are you a fan of The Last Dance? Are you enjoying this documentary? I am. Like it's a lot of stuff I knew already, like the okay. mentality of Mike just playing with some of the guys that he had played against, you know, like when I was a rookie. Like I was always intrigued by the, like by my vets, by uh, Grant Long and Ike Austin. Like I had some some good guys around me mm -hmm. that kind of took me under their wing and just kind of showed me how to be a professional. But they also tell you, like they play all these little crazy tricks on you and, and do all this stuff. Pop, like pranks? Pop, pranks, put popcorn in your car, make you bring newspapers and donuts and stuff to the to practice. and. Like for me, I was the only rookie, so I hated. Like I didn't, I didn't do it all the time, so I probably got punished for it a lot. So okay, we, we I guess we don't want to get into that about the punish. Punished by the players, <laughs> not by. Well, I know, I know. I'm saying about like some of the things that may have happened. Yeah, like yeah. it was. Like they played some, some tricks on me, man. I I remember after one game. Here we go. One of my teammates, Grant Long. I know you're probably gonna see this. I don't know, he asked me to do something. I probably didn't do it. 
So I got ready to put my clothes on after the game. I go to put my shoes on. It's eggs and fruit, all powder, baby powder, all in the in my shoes. I put my shoe on, crack the eggs. And, <laughs> like, man, like these dudes are crazy. <laughs> <laughs> savage. So you you was on some savage, like man, I'm gonna do what I want. You well, know, get not not really, cause I was by myself. Most teams draft two rookies. Okay. So I was I was by myself, in in a foreign country. I was in, we, you know I got drafted to Vancouver to Canada. Okay. So I I didn't really have any other. I didn't have another rookie that was like helping me do all the stuff. And like it was tough. Yeah, oh, it was wow. tough. Oh wow. Y'all already know, like I said, in this show, we're going to have segments. Like, so we're talking about the last dance right now. But before, like I say, wrap the show up, we're going to get into our next topic. But we got to get Stroll story. Every show, when we watch the Stroll show, we got to get a story at the end. If you have not seen the interview with Social Ghost, with Stroll Miles Swift, you have to watch that. Because I swear, we're going to have to get him to tell that story again about his experience when he was playing in China with the chickens and the, the cow penis. And like I said, you may get that again. You may not, but watch the show. You can actually get it firsthand. So, all right, Stroll. So we're going to go ahead and go into the next subject. And we're going to go ahead and talk about the draft experience. Right now, we have the 2020 NFL draft going on TV right now as we speak. And you being able to relate to that actually being drafted. So we want to kind of talk about how you felt. Like, what did you do? You know, I guess the they had maybe a festivities leading up to the draft. Like, how was that experience for you? And then, you know, what do you feel that the players are feeling now going through the virtual draft and stuff like that? Can you speak on that for us? Man, for some, it could be a little bit overwhelming. Like, for me, I was, and I was just overjoyed, excited just to have my family and my friends. Like, I, I never forget, like, just, like, my mom being there, like, my sister. Shout out brother. to Shan. Shout out to Liz. And man, just being able to to have him there to enjoy this that moment and, and the process, just going through the process. It was exciting just uh just knowing that my dream, like the stuff that I put in so much work to get to that point. And just being moments away of my name being called and walking across the stage to to shake the commissioner's hand, like it was a dream come true. And and it was it was awesome. So I can imagine what these guys are going through this, at this NFL draft. So it was it was pretty cool, man. It was just a memorable moment. Okay, so the draft process. Okay, with the draft process, I mean you did you have an idea of where you could possibly go prior to or was it more of a you know like where you didn't kinda know? Well, not to cut you off, but before you know, before we started the show, uh, I was just telling you a little bit about like after the Sweet Sixteen. Okay. In college, I had every intention on coming back to school, but I wanted to test and see. Like I, I forget what they call it now, like the draft portal. Where yeah. Guys can. Because they didn't have it back then. Yeah, they didn't, but they did. Okay. But now it's 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 like they can go and work out for the teams and not sign with the agent, and they're still eligible to come back and play. Okay. So that's that's pretty much what I did. I went because my goal was to, if I was in the top five of the draft, then I would like come out. Okay. And I worked out for the top five teams. I think uh, New Jersey, Vancouver, Chicago, uh, the Clippers, Orlando. I can't remember which one had had the top five picks, but uh, like I worked out for all of those teams and. Once I got back to Baton Rouge, they, they called me back and with the draft evaluation and let me know where my stock was and where I would go. And I just kept getting phone calls from New Jersey and Vancouver. Vancouver told me if I'm there at number two that they would take me. Okay. So I was satisfied with that. I went back to Baton Rouge and I let my coaches and everybody know that, that I was gonna go out and put my name in the draft. Like they weren't happy about it, but I think it was the right decision for me and my family. Okay, and that in that particular draft, the the, the Nets had the first pick, yeah, right? New Jersey. Nets okay, so it was Kenyon Martin. Kenyon Martin. Okay, okay, and y'all both kind of relatively played the same position. Yeah. K. Martin. Yeah. Okay, okay. So all right, also going through the draft experience now. In your mind and in your heart, if you had, if you were able to choose, what team would you uh, would have loved to be drafted by? Um. Team that I wanted to go to was uh, Orlando Magic. 
Okay. I like. I think Doc Rivers was the coach there, and I like the style of play. And like he told me, if I would have been there at five, they probably he would have took me. So that's that's why I, if I could do it over, and I would have got a chance to play again, play with T Mac. So that that would have been cool. So. Okay. Was, the NFL draft. So you've been able to sit in and kind of partake and watch the draft. I mean, what you think about the virtual experience? I thought it was actually pretty cool, like just being able to be home with your family, and that's it's an experience that they won't get again. Like it's a one-time experience where you're able to get your nice suit and dress your mom and your family up, and y'all y'all get to sit in that green room and just sit there and wait until your name is is called. Like you you don't get that experience to to walk across that stage and and, and shake their commissioner's hand, and like this it's just an unbelievable experience. Just due to this, this pandemic, that they're not able to do it right now. But man, just being drafted, living out your dream, doing something that you love to do and get paid for it, and you, you can't beat that. So I'm, I'm pretty sure those guys are still having that same excitement, just just hearing their names called on ESPN. So okay, do you remember your fit? Do you remember what you wore? I re I remember it down to the T. I had a, a navy blue pinstripe suit with a baby blue tie. And uh, I think it was a white shirt, but it was it was nice. It was okay. <laughs> you said navy blue. You almost. It seemed like you almost had some Cowboys colors going. I know well, you know yeah, it's the NFL yeah. draft, so I just wanted to. No, no Cowboys. Okay. No, I mean, we got a lot of people watching, and you saying this. Yeah, every everybody that knows me know how I feel about the Cowboys, so there's, there's no secret. Okay, so you know we can go ahead and move on uh, to the next subject. You yeah. know we don't have to. You know, get into that, you know, that narrative. You know, we don't have to talk about that maybe, today. Maybe another segment. Okay. And, and maybe not. <laughs> 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 All right, y'all. So, like I say, we, we're here with former NBA basketball legend, one of my good friends, my fam, Mr. Stromile Swift. So, like I said, man, we're going to get into the final segment of this week's show. And, like I said, if you've seen the interview with Stromile Swift, he told us a story about his experience being in China and actually being able to partake in the delicacies. So, man, this week, Stro, and like I said, this is a very big deal, man. We're going to give you the screen, man. We want to hear about an experience that you you went through, a memorable, maybe more of a comical situation that you actually went through throughout your time in life. You want to hear about that now? Yeah, yeah, we, we, we would love to. And I, I got to... We're dying here. Like my... <laughs> so I'll tell you about one of the it didn't happen to me okay but this was in my ninth year in the league this was like right after my mom had passed I was struggling and going through a hard time I couldn't really focus on the game I really had at that point I had kind of lost the love for just to play basketball but when I was on the court like everything was fine but I had so much time like just to be alone like it, it really affected me just like the focus that it takes to play at that high level like I didn't have it so I was released by the New Jersey Nets and I signed right away with the Phoenix Sun so I go to this team uh, on Phoenix Steve Nash at the point guard Amari Stoudemire uh, Sean Marion uh, Shaquille O'Neal Jason Rich like all these guys but what was so what was so cool about about this team was all the other teams that I played on, like wives and girlfriends couldn't travel on the on the planes on okay. the bus. But this team was so close; it was kind of like a like a big family. So they would let the wives and and girlfriends like travel on the, on the plane. So I'm on the plane with with Shaq, his wife Shawnee, uh, Grant Hill, his wife Tamia. You know, she's a recording artist, like probably one of the greatest. And man, just being on the bus and being on the plane with those guys, like cracking jokes and like sometimes it was almost like a like a concert because Tamia was singing like Grant like Grant actually plays, like he would bring his little guitar on the on the plane and like man, it was you know, Shaq raps and like it was some live concerts on the plane. So I, I thought that was pretty cool. And then uh actually Matt Barnes was on the team. So he's him and Steven Jackson does the uh, podcast up in up in Smoke. Okay. But man, Matt had lost his mom maybe like a couple of months, and 
think he was one of the first people that told me about um, like getting counseling, like how it works. So I always, I never thought like to sit down and talk to somebody about my problems would, would help me. But Matt, man, he like he probably don't know it, but he really helped me a lot, just encouraging me to talk to somebody about it, like just letting it all sit on you, and and then one day it just explode. But uh, man, I like it was cool, like just being on that team and like going through that, getting the, getting the help that I needed, the counseling. And, stuff like that but one of the craziest things that happened when I was there man everybody that knows Shaquille like man he's a like a huge prankster like plays jokes on everybody and uh, we had this this kid on the on the team I, I don't know I don't even know if he was a rookie and I can't think of his name uh, right now but anyway he lived down the street from the arena so he would ride his bike to the to practice and to the games and, uh, he played on the team. He played, just on, for, he played, okay. played on the team. I can't think his name right now. Uh, man, had long, long, pretty hair. Like he don't look like a basketball player, but long hair. Like Shaq always, like teased him all the time. But he used to ride his bike to the to the gym. So every day, like Shaq would do something to his bike. It's like man, like you making all this money, and you riding a bike to the <laughs> to the game. So they would just like crack jokes on him all the time. And uh, like one day he came to practice and Shaq took his bike and hit it all the way in the, the top of the arena. Like, I don't, I don't even know what, what level it was on, but it was in the nose, but he hit his bike. So we get out of practice, the guy looking for his bike. So they tell him, like, man, Shaq put your bike way up there in uh, the upper levels. So he had to walk up there and get his bike and ride home. So every day Shaq was playing jokes on his kid. His name is Lewis and Mutson. Okay, yeah, Lewis. Lewis, Lewis and Mutson. Okay. Um, so one day, another day, he comes from practice. Just the way the practice was set up, like if you were a younger guy, like you go in and practice, the younger guys have to stay out to practice, get extra work. Okay. So, you know, Shaq was a vet. We get out of practice, he would leave, go get treatment, he leave and go home. So he gets the kid bike, and he bought one of those old school telephones. The rotary? Yeah, he, he okay. bought one of those old school telephones, and he rigged it up to the top of the top of the guy bike, and took his handlebars off and got oranges like grapefruits and slid them on the handlebars. So he had like two grapefruits <laughs> on the handlebars. <laughs> <laughs> So with a telephone on, like I don't, I don't know where he come up with this stuff, but man, this, this dude was he was funny. So the kid comes out. Sometimes I used to wait wait around the locker room just to see the expression on his face, just to see like when he would come in. But um, man, it was it was some fun times, man. I remember one time he um, he decided he was gonna get Shaq back. Lewis Edmondson. Yeah, he decided he was gonna play a prank on Shaq. So you know every city that Shaq goes to. He wears, you know, he gets uh, deputized or whatever they call it. Like he's a policeman, real okay. life, real life policeman. Like, okay. So he was a policeman in Phoenix. So he had his badge. It was like a little necklace, but he had his badge. Okay. So he go. Lewis goes, and I think Shaq was getting treatment. So Lewis goes and hides Shaq badge, and he was pissed. Did he know? Yeah, he he, he found out. So he he hid the bag. He hid his badge. Normally, they get popcorn and pour it in the, in the sunroof and like flood your car, flood your vehicle with popcorn. Okay. So when you open the door, popcorn comes flowing out. So he didn't want to, like Shaq, like he tricked out all his vehicles. So he had this, like this van that had a, like almost looked like a studio in there, video games, all kind of like it was, it was sweet, it was laid out. Okay. So he didn't want to put popcorn in it because he didn't want to have to pay for it. If he damaged anything, because the popcorn had butter and all this stuff on it, so he got those. Um, I forget what they call them, but when you package the uh, the boxes and like stuff, like the bubble wrap yeah, with the, the bubble, but it was bubble wrap, but it was a little styrofoam thing. Oh, okay. So he, I don't know where he got it from, but he filled Shaq van up with the little styrofoam package and stuff. Okay. So Shaq comes out in the in the garage to get in his vehicle. So they got a camera. He's 
Lewis had the camera crew, I guess from the team, I don't know where they were from, but he had the camera crew out there waiting on Shaq to come out. When he hit the remote and the doors slid back, all you see is that pop the, the package and the styrofoam package and flowing out Shaq's truck. Everybody was like crying laughing. So the story that I can't tell is what Shaq did to him after. Oh, Lord. So like, I can't get in there. I can't reveal the, the locker room secrets, but, man, it was it was hilarious. So what, what Lewis did, did that kind of overtake what Shaq did to him? Do Not you think? at all. Not at all. Like, the revenge was crazy. Like, they tried to hold him down. Like, he had this, like I said, he had this long, pretty hair. The only thing saved him was uh, Alvin Gentry. Alvin Gentry was the head coach in Phoenix. That's the only thing that saved him, because Shaq had some clippers, and he actually plugged them. He plugged them, but that wasn't the bad part. He plugged them, but his hair was so long that like, he could he could hide it, so nobody could really see. But he was getting ready to shave and ball. Man, it was it was hilarious. it was so funny. And I tell my friends this story all the time, but it was funny. Like I I tell you the real story off camera. <laughs> It's, it's, it's too graphic to tell on camera. Okay, well, what do you what do you what do you think Shaq would probably say if you if he heard you telling this story? You think he probably want to come on and tell us more of it or what you no, think? I, his favorite line is "snitches get stitches," so <laughs> I can't tell it. I can't tell the story. <laughs> oh, you got a target on your back. Yeah, I can't tell this story. Oh wow. Hey, so like I said, for our Facebook Live audience. Um, I'm Shady Will, and like I said, we're here with NBA le legend and host of the Stroh Show, Mr. Stroh Miles Swift. And like I said, hopefully, we're going to have a show weekly. Hopefully, like I said, weekly with Mr. Stroh Miles Swift. And um, we're going to get more stories, we're going to get more information. And like I said, I really enjoyed it. I hope y'all enjoyed the first segment of the Stroh Show. And like I said, hopefully, we can do this again because he has plenty of stories, which he said. Yeah. So, I mean, hopefully, like, right. if you want to chime in and ask questions. I got, I got a couple. You <laughs> say you got a couple. But if you, for our Facebook Live artists, our Social Go Live artists, if you have questions, please ask questions. Like I said, the last dance coming on uh, this Sunday. And like I said, Stro was actually able to post that picture with his experience playing against Mike. So, you know, when he comes on, you know, ask questions. You know, maybe y'all can get some information I can't get. So, hey, y'all been watching the Stro Show. We'll catch y'all next week. Holla. Later.